Hello guys, in this video I'll be talking about the references that I used and how I study internal medicine in medical school. So, internal medicine seems to be more agreed upon really online compared to, let's say, pediatrics. So the references and the recommendations are not so varied and you'll find that the advice I'll be giving here is similar to other videos but I'll be introducing one more thing so I hope this can be helpful. So the book that I prefer using is Step Up to Medicine the fourth edition. There is a fifth edition, so make sure that you get it. I think it was out last year. Um, so the size of this book is, as you can see, it's not so large. It's 500 pages, and it follows a bullet point style. But the good thing about it, unlike BRS, Pediatrics, and other books that I spoke about in the previous video, is that it has a mix of everything, really. So I think it's a perfect book for medicine, and I wish there was something like it for pediatrics. But anyways, so it follows a bullet point style, as you can see. So it starts with the organ, let's say here, diseases of the pancreas, and then it moves on to the relevant physiology, and then compares types of diabetes. As you can see, there are nice tables here that explain the high yield concepts. You have a nice uh, space here for any annotations that you may need, and which I used very well. You have here boxes for high yield of formation that can be common mistakes for students when they're learning a specific topic. And here you have the tables for the common numbers and for the diagnostic criteria, so this is important. And you also have nice algorithms here and uh, flow diagrams. So I think this is a perfect book for medicine and uh, it has a really nice, uh, a nice approach. Now, also, it has, at the end of the book, there are questions here that we can use to solidify the information. So it's a nice book. It's really the most commonly used book by medical students uh, worldwide, as far as I know. There is one competitor. It is Kaplan's Internal Medicine. Uh, some people have asked me about it. And this was really a choice that I had also when I was uh, about to decide between this and Kaplan. I checked them both out, and they are really similar. So it doesn't really matter, I think, you can follow your preference. I like this one more because um, it's more commonly used because of the bullet points. So that was my personal choice. But you can uh, try them both and see what suits you. Now, the second book that I think is a must for internal medicine students is The ECG Made Easy by John Hampton. And this is a fairly small book. It's not really a book, it's more like a notebook. So, it's 180 pages or 200 pages, and it's really, it's not so te text heavy, so as you can see, it's largely made up of pages on the ECG. So, so you, we, here we have ventricular tachycardia, and here we have the text explaining it. Now, when I started my internal medicine rotation, my knowledge in the ECG was zero, so when I looked at the uh, stri uh, strip for the ECG, it was like I was reading Chinese. So it was so difficult for me, I had no idea what was on the paper. But after spending some time with this book, after finishing the first hundred pages especially, because that's the most important one, the first half really covers uh, most what's, uh, of what's relevant to us. So after reading this book, it was much, much more easier to read the ECG, and um, it was really more like second nature. So it offers a lot of practice and I think it's really necessary, it's easy to read. You can easily do it in um, two weeks, let's say, if you're going really slow. I was really just reading this in the bus. I didn't spend time reading this um, at home. I was spending more time with this book. I was reading this in the bus. So by that time that the major had ended, before that I was done with this book and I took some really good notes and I also made Anki cards for them. So this is a really useful one because this book is not going to teach you how to read the ECG. Yes, this will explain the acute coronary syndrome, it will explain myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, and so on, but it will not teach you to read the uh, ECG. So that's where you need to supplement it with this book. Now, as for handbooks, uh, the handbook that I used when I was uh, taking that rotation is the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. Um, it's a really common book, and I liked it quite well. 
it's it really looks small so it's only um, 800 pages but yet it's really a textbook it is called a handbook but practically it is a textbook because it contains really more information in here in this small uh, book than this one uh, so just to give you a, uh, an example so see how the uh, pages are condensed so it's really heavy in text um, but that's a good thing actually because uh, if you want some quick reference that you can put in your pocket you can access anytime and you can read the most high yield information about that topic without any um, um, minutia let's say without any detailed explanation it assumes really that you know the basics so if you want to learn something from uh, zero I don't think this will be uh, really useful even though it explains things well but uh, when you're going and explaining something in a very summarized way, it's difficult to retain all of that uh, information. And this is where this book comes in. But this book is still good for revision, I think, and for uh, clinical practice. So if you want, let's say you are studying acute kidney injury, acute renal failure. Now this book will teach you uh, all the information that you need as a student for, for acute kidney injury. It will tell you the etiology, the differential diagnosis, the causes, and then it will move on to the signs and symptoms and some basic principles of management. But now if you want the details and some more detail on that, if you are in the emergency department, if you want to think what would you do in real life, then this is the book for you because here it gives you the basics and then you have the diagnostic criteria and here you have the algorithm, a basic, let's say, algorithm flow chart that you can follow to know what you should do so it offers a little bit more detail it's more uh, practice oriented so that's what makes it good it has some extra information uh, compared to here um, I found some really good pearls even though they are hard to find but let's say sometimes it has a single statement a single sentence that can be really really amazing to remember uh, like the one I offered uh, I think it in one of my earlier videos when I said that a patient has abdominal pain and the Oxford handbook says that with any patient with a non-specific or vague abdominal pain that you really don't know the cause you should do a glucose check for every patient of such a case uh, so even though this is a simple statement but it can be really useful in real life um, and you should keep it with you so I think this was this was a useful book that um, is not really, um, it's not a bad idea to use. It also has these reference intervals, which I found very useful. And really, by the time that you, that you finish internal medicine, we should remember the basic uh, reference intervals for the common things like the blood workup, the YBCs, the electrolytes. Um, these things are, we encounter them in our everyday life. So by the time we finish this, we should remember the reference intervals and I remember the ones which are in here. I put them on Anki and I kept revising them. So that's also, I think, important to mention. By the end of the handbook, there is a chapter or a section for the emergencies. So that's also very useful. So this is the one for, just to show you an example, for anaphylactic shock. Now you will study anaphylaxis from here and it will give you the things that you need to know as a student and the things that you will be tested on. So if you now, if you're asking about tests, this is the one that will give you the uh, information that you will need for the exam. This is more oriented towards practice and it doesn't, even though it may offer the same information, but it doesn't present it in the way that will help you answer the questions on the test and retain them and know what's important for you. But this is more oriented towards practice. So here it talks about anaphylaxis. And then here you have uh, an algorithm or it's not really an algorithm, it's uh, a flow sheet that tells you how to deal with that situation so this book was nice and I recommend it for people it also has a section in cardiology on the explanation of ECG so it has a lot of practice parts here so this is uh, a bundle branch block and here we have an ST segment elevation so I, it's, it's, I think it's around 10 pages or so. So I studied these, even though, of course, uh, this gave me also 
a good amount of information, but I needed more practice. So the ECG examples in here and the explanations were also very useful. And finally, Kumar and Clark's clinical medicine. Um, honestly, I was really excited when I started internal medicine, so I thought I needed a big reference. And it was a choice between Davidson and Kumar and Clark, the, the two big books. So in the end, I decided on Kumar and Clark. So it's a fairly large book. It's a thousand and a hundred pages. And sometimes it has good algorithms. It has some good pictures. Uh, things that of the pathophysiology of the most recent research that cannot be found in these books, you will find it here. But honestly, I didn't really use this book much, even though it seems like a giant book, but I didn't find it offered more information than the previous two, even though it's much more large, but in the end, it would spend more time explaining the same thing. Uh, so you'd be lost looking at the trees instead of understanding the forest. Um, so I read about a chapter or two from this book when I was reading the, the respiratory system, and it really didn't change my understanding. But one thing I think I should note is that when studying the acute coronary syndrome, so you have ST segment elevation MI, non-ST segment elevation MI, and unstable angina, um, it was a little bit tough to understand from this book, and this is the first topic that we study in terminal medicine. It was a bit tough to study from this one because there was an algorithm missing, and I found the perfect algorithm that explained it in Davidson. In the cardiovascular chapter, there's an algorithm for acute coronary syndrome, so make sure to check it out when you're studying this. Otherwise, I didn't really think that these books were necessary. Sometimes they are helpful. Sometimes these um, dense books, they offer some um, trivia, some nice information that can be fun to know, but not really that critical. So what are the most important things in medicine? Uh, of course, you should start by the cardiovascular system. So in pediatrics, we said that the most important thing to know in pediatrics is the respiratory. But in, in medicine here, it's the most important thing to study is the cardiovascular system. And it is the first chapter in this book. Otherwise, then you can move on to the respiratory system, like COPD and asthma and sarcoidosis. Um, and really, every, by the time that you finish internal medicine, you are expected to know everything or most things in medicine. Uh, so you have to study as much as you can from this book. I'm not going to mention uh, separate diseases like I did in pediatrics, uh, but really you should finish as much as possible from this book. Now I have created an Anki deck when I was studying telemedicine and I summarized some concepts from here, um, especially the rheumatology chapter. So I summarized the rheumatology chapter in my Anki uh, quite well. So I'll put a link in the description below for you to check it out if you are interested, and I think this will be very helpful. It also contains the reference intervals and many uh, examples and explanations for the ECG that you can use. I think that's it for internal medicine, and um, thank you for watching.